mathematics and had enormous influence on mathematics in general. He um, passed away last August. And <clears throat> I, after he died, I was asked to give a colloquium talk about his work at the University of Maryland. And since then, I've been studying some of his work and his thoughts about mathematics. And that's what I'd like to present in this talk. So <clears throat> let me briefly describe, give a biography of him. So um, Thurston, he was born here in Washington, D.C. in um, 1946 and <clears throat> grew up in Wheaton, Maryland. Um, he went to college in New College in Sarasota, Florida. And then in um, 1972, <clears throat> earned a um, PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, at this point, he was um, really revolutionizing mathematics in a big way. And um, I'll describe a, a little bit of this later in the talk. <clears throat> Two years later, in 1974, he was a appointed a full professor at Princeton, where he spent a good deal of his career. <laughs> The age of 28. Um, I met him after I was an undergraduate at Princeton and at that um, Princeton University is <coughs> had a tradition of encouraging undergraduate research and the senior thesis is a very big thing there and I was looking for something to work on for a senior thesis and where his professor said, well, we just hired this new guy that might be an interesting person to, to work with. And they were right, and I don't. <laughs> Started working with him my last two years as an undergraduate. I wrote my senior thesis with him. Um, <clears throat> there, he encouraged me to um, go to graduate school at, um, at Berkeley, which is what I did, and ended up working with his thesis advisor. Mo Hirsch. Then when I finished, he and Dennis Sullivan spent the academic year 1980-81 at um, the University of Colorado in Boulder, where I worked with him as a postdoc. So <clears throat> after a self-imposed exile to Berkeley, I worked with him for my last two years as an undergraduate and postdoc. Um, after that, he, in um, 1982, he was awarded a field medal. Um, somewhat later, he had always been very much involved in um, experimentation in mathematics. I remember when I was started, one of the first times I met him, I went into his office in Princeton. And, 1975, and he had this little Calcomp plotter drawing some incredible pictures. Um, I was asked him what it was. He said, well, you take an irrational slope foliation on a torus and apply the virus for P function. Got that. It makes a lot of sense now. But he had always been involved in it <clears throat> and was aware that technology could be used to visualize geometric phenomena. And um, Around 1990, he was instrumental in setting up the um, Geometry Center at the University of Minnesota. So this was, I don't know if that, these things exist anymore, but it was, it was a science and technology center, and this was the one science and technology, NSF funded science and technology center in mathematics. Later, it um, unfortunately closed around 1995. Um, Around that, in 1991, he moved to California, back to Berkeley, because in 1993, he became the director of MSRI, 
And a few years later, he moved to the University of California, Davis. And a few years later, he moved to Cornell. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the Fields Medal, but he won a number of other awards, such as the Bevelin Prize in Geometry and the Waterman Award. And last year, about a year ago, joint meetings, 2012, he was awarded the Steel Prize from the AMS for his contributions to mathematics. And then passed away. In last August. So in this talk, I'd like to describe some of um, the ma his mathematical contributions. And I think the more than just the theorems that he proved and the ideas that he generated, their whole approach to mathematics he influenced. And I, <clears throat> in Researching this talk, I was led to look at a, a very interesting paper that I recommend in 1994 in the bulletin of the AMS, an article about called On Progress and Proof. In mathematics. And some of it is explaining what he thinks we're doing as mathematicians. And this was in response to a controversial article by Jaffe and Quinn about theoretical mathematics and lack of rigor and the harms of lack of rigor. And one paragraph is directed to Thurston and his lack of rigor. And part of the article is to say that the, the questions that they're raising are not really the right questions and what, what it is what we're doing as mathematics. And the first part of the article describes what it is, and his idea is um, what we're doing as mathematicians. And he says that the, that's just a statement, how do mathematicians advance the human understanding of mathematics? And I think it's very interesting reading this, and I recommend it. The second part of the article is somewhat autobiographical and talks about his experience in the areas that he studied. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to describe in a short talk all the different contributions that he's made, and I'm not confident to do that anyway. But what I would like to talk about in sort of the historical order, and I'll tell you what I'm not going to talk about, is the first subject that he worked on was foliation theory. And in some sense answered the main questions that no one was even close to looking at. Um, <clears throat> this was done maybe up until about 1975. And I <clears throat> was the work that awarded him the professorship at Princeton. I was reading the papers when I started working with them, but it didn't seem like anybody else was reading. And the papers aren't that easy to read, and they were sort of the end of the story, it seemed. And he addresses this in his article, that people were congratulating for killing off the field. That he had solved these problems that nobody else had, had even thought about might be true. And rather than trying to digest the ideas, they left the field. And eventually, he had no one to talk to about the subject. He left the field. And remarks that more people knew about the subject of foliations in 1975 than they do now, or 1994. Probably even more true now. And I think this was maybe an interesting reflection on the self-destructive self -destructive aspects of our profession. And that um, the success is to kill the field. And he comments in the article how um, people were congratulating killing the field. So he was destroying jobs. Well, he was more successful at creating jobs in the next two areas. And so 
When I started working with him in 1975, he was giving a course on surface diffeomorphisms and two-dimensional topology. And as a student interested in topology at the time, people said, well, everything's known in one dimension and two dimensions. Nobody knows anything in three dimensions and four dimensions, but everything was known. There was a very successful theory of classifying manifolds in higher dimensions. So um, first we showed that in dimensions one and two, there's actually a very rich structure that hadn't really been um, addressed until the 1970s. So I'll say something about the theory of surface diffeomorphisms, which really led to an explosion relating two-dimensional topology and dynamical systems, and uh, Riemann surface theory, type number theory. Uh, the following year, he moved up to dimension three and gave a course on three manifolds, and in particular, geometric structures on three manifolds. And the most interesting geometric structures that, and these were things that he had been looking at since he was an undergraduate at New College, were three manifolds that had a um, hyperbolic geometry on them. So, particular hyperbolic three manifolds. <clears throat> and at the beginning of the course, he described a notion of geometric structure, which is now um, called a locally homogeneous geometric structure. These were the study of which really began with Aristotle in the 1930s. And these were ways of putting a geometry on a topological manifold where the coordinate charts map into a certain geometry, like hyperbolic geometry or Euclidean geometry. And as you go from one coordinate system to the next, one system of local coordinates to overlapping local coordinates, then the coordinate change is given by an automorphism of the geometry. And this is the context. And he showed that, and he said that there were going to be um, eight geometries, which would be useful for studying three manifolds, and conjectured that every three manifold can be canonically decomposed into geometric pieces. And I think maybe his most significant um, technical uh, mathematical contribution would be the geometry, geometrization conjecture, which was recently proved by Carroll. And I think it's maybe significant that the most significant achievement is actually conjecture, because it maybe indicates the open-endedness of our subject. Okay, so I, these are the topics that I will discuss in this talk, but they're just a small amount of a number of things that I'm he contributed to. These are a few of the things that I won't talk about. Um, using some of the I, so. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the theory of surfaces in three manifolds and hyperbolic geometry were very closely related to Riemann surfaces. And um, moduli Riemann surfaces, which is called Teichmuller theory. Um, about the same time as, this was in the late 70s, there are some <coughs> remarkable developments in homomorphic dynamical systems. And there's some of the ideas that were used in geometrizing three manifolds had applications and analogs in complex dynamics. I might mention also that there was a, 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 a at the same time in the late 70s, he was working with Milner on, on the one dimensional. 
In topology, the most important invariant of a um, two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space is its fundamental group. And the um, universal covering space of a manifold looks like the fundamental group. The manifold is compact. And the subject of combinatorial group theory, say so groups given by generators and relations, acquired a new geometric flavor by, through the work of Thurston and Gromov. And the subject was renamed or um, renovated, as a, which is now called geometric group theory. To which Thurston had a major influence. Um, Before the, the geometry center um, represented a, a, an effort to um, institutionalize and really develop um, the visualization tools in you know, a significant way. And at the geometry center, um, they, pr they produce two videotapes, which I highly recommend. Classics, because I don't think there are any, anything like that will be produced now. Um, you can find them on YouTube. Um, Thurston really liked puns. And he, um, the first one is called Not Not. <laughs> and it describes the hyperbolic geometry and the quantum of a knot. So a knot is a, an embedded circle in the three space, or in the three sphere. And so the complement of a knot is what's not in the knot <laughs> and is the subject of this, uh, of this videotape. It's a, little, it's a little bit strange because it doesn't really have, it's not clear what the audience is. So it starts at a very low level. And at, at about what, 10, 20 minutes into the through. talk, you're gliding through you know, a tessellation of hyperbolic three space. And it, 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 somewhere it accelerates. But it's well worth looking at. And, um, it was followed by another um, another videotape, also on YouTube, called Outside In, which animates a any version of the sphere that he came up with. And this is an amazing picture of how you take a sphere and turn it inside out through. Um, the regular homotopy of immersions in three space. And um, his efforts in visualization, I remember I, I got involved in visualization after my years of postdoc in Boulder. And I had been studying geometric structures on manifolds and in particular projective structures and really wanted to know what they looked like. And I realized at the time that it was going to be a big time sink to work to, since I had never done any computer programming before. And it turned out to be a big time sink. But I think it was very useful. But I remember a discussion with one of my colleagues who said, oh, this is very interesting. They saw these pictures. Of, things on the boundary of complex hyperbolic space, but it's not really mathematics. And it wasn't really rigorous mathematics, but it certainly developed an intuition and it communicated some mathematical ideas. And I think it really is mathematics, but it wasn't a traditional um, theorem or proof. And people would ask, well, does it help you prove theorems? I never really was sure if that was the case or not, because you don't really have anything to test it against. But, um, you know, it certainly developed intuition and it was a form of communicating mathematics. And I think Thurston's realization that these are valid forms of mathematical expression was very much related to um, his interest in education and outreach. 
at the time that he was involved in the Geometry Center, he had um, developed a course with um, several other people called Geometry and the Imagination, named after the Helper and Kohn-Vasa by that name. And the, as far as teaching and uh, disseminating math mathematics, in particular, geometric ideas. Um, I might mention that. What I want, more of the topics. In the, the relationship of mathematics and art, and um, last summer I went to the one day at the Bridges conference in, in Towson and saw lots of interesting examples of things that related to hyperbolic geometry and things made with them. Three-dimensional printers, pretty amazing. Objects, um, you can see um, hyperbolic geometry, dresses, crochets that are um, made in hyperbolic geometry. And you can, it's probably easy to find these things by a simple search on the web. And most recently, in around 2010, he started working with the <laughs> Japanese fashion designer that applied um, um, ideas of geometrization and the eight geometries to a fashion design. And there's a nice article by Kelly Delp in Math Horizons last summer that describes mathematics and fashion design. Okay, so these are some of the things that I will and won't talk about in the remainder of Yeah, so maybe I should emphasize in visual, the geometric group theory and visualization were really part of another major contribution that he made, and that's the relationship of mathematics and computer science. And the different kinds of geometries, which I'll say a little bit later in the talk, all correspond to different kinds of combinatorial configurations and networks. And there are some very interesting papers about using different kinds of geometries to model communication networks. And in geometric group theory, a group is a, a group gen, given by generators and relations gives rise to a graph, a scaly graph of the group. And the common editorial properties of that correspond to a certain properties of the network, and that's good for applications of computer, computer science. So let me say a little bit about how he first came on the scene in studying topology and, and geometry. So, Algebraic topology, maybe we said, began in the late 19th century with the work of Poincaré and others. And the techniques of algebraic topology led to certain invariants of spaces, and one would have the naive hope of using these invariants to classify spaces, say, to homeomorphism. So, for example, you might take a surface and then decompose it into pieces that were like triangles. This is such a decomposition is called the triangulation. And the simplest example, so you'd have the triangulation of a manifold. So a manifold is, is a space that at every point it has a neighborhood which is homeomorphic to Euclidean space, so every point has Euclidean local coordinates. And a triangulation would be a decomposition 
simple sieves of various dimensions. So zero dimensional simple sieves are just points. One dimensional simple sieves are line segments. Two dimensional simple sieves are triangles. Three dimensional simple sieves would be tetrahedron, etc. And the simplest example of an algebraic topological invariant would be the Euler characteristic. Which in the case of the surface would be the number of vertices, the number of zero dimensional faces, minus the number of edges, that is the number of simplices of dimension one, plus the number of faces, triangles, which is two. And this is an integer. And the, it's proved in the 19th century that for a closed orientable surface, say if the surface has genus G, it's closed, no, no boundary, and compact, and it's orientable, then the Euler characteristic is just 2 minus twice the genus, 2 minus 2G. G is the number of handles. And this is a complete invariant of homeomorphism. Well, the theory developed in the next hundred years, <clears throat> and by 1970, it was known that these invariants generalizing the Euler characteristic, which are called characteristic classes, led to invariants that could classify manifolds. So the precise statement that, that um, these could classify closed manifolds and manifolds in the dimension of dimension at least five. And we assume that the fundamental group that it's simply connected. And so there were a finite set of invariants that classify these manifolds up to homeomorphism. And this was the culmination of a great deal of work. So very little was known at that time in dimensions three and four. Dimension two had been settled much earlier. Um, things were very complicated because the fundamental group could be quite complicated. But if you assume that the fundamental group was say a finite group, then you wanted to know the answer badly enough and had some very good algebraic colleagues that you could ask to compute various um, groups with one could effectively classify manifolds under these conditions. And so this was sort of the situation in geometric topology. <coughs> around 1970, I'm told. And so people wanted to, who were looking for other subjects to, um, to work on, and the more geometrically minded ones often went into subjects like the systems. One of the major results that led to this huge success story in topology was um, the H. Covortism theorem of Smale. Yeah, which was enough to prove the Poincaré conjecture in dimensions five and greater. And <clears throat> I think around the time that Smale did that, he thought that very interesting problems really were more in dynamical systems and trying to predict, say, what do you have to <coughs> point under an arbitrary homeomorphism. So in the 1960s, there, an American school of dynamical systems developed. <coughs> And this was, in some sense, the context in which their students was very important. Sort of halfway between dynamical systems, so one example would be a, a vector field on a manifold. So you might imagine every, every point, there's a direction that's specified. And this gives rise to a, um, a flow, an action of the real numbers by diffeomorphism. Sort of take a point and you move it in the direction of the arrow. 
And if you assume that the specter field has no zeros, then the trajectories fill up the manifold. So at every point has a neighborhood which is filled up by these submanifolds. In this case, these are just one-dimensional submanifolds, they're curves. And this picture is what is a special case of the general object of geometry called the foliation. Okay, so foliation is a decomposition of a manifold into submanifolds such that the locally, the manifold locally looks like Rn. And the foliation locally looks like a decomposition of Rn into Rks. dimension n minus k foliation. So it's given by this local product structure. And these things exist in many natural situations. And in particular, the most some of the most interesting dynamical systems that Smale and Anasov and Sinai had studied, generalizing the <coughs> really important example of explaining geodesic flows on negatively curved Riemannian manifolds. say a little more about this, which hyperbolic manifolds are a special case, these gave, gave rise to very interesting and complicated foliations. Okay. And in differential geometry, if one has a flat connection, one gets foliations which are very complicated and interesting. And so Many questions that have been studied for manifolds could be then applied with a new sort of dynamical aspect to study foliations. And so the main thing that went into building the characteristic class theory was a classifying space, the space that represented all possible kinds of topological behavior. And the things like the tangent bundle of a manifold could be understood in terms of maps into a classifying space. So in the standard case, this would correspond to a um, cross line. Just record using the Gauss map where the tangent plane to a manifold lives. Well, Heffliger found a um, similar classifying space for foliations called B gamma. And a foliation would have a classifying map which would be into this very large space. And the invariance, the analog of characteristic classes of foli of manifolds were characteristic classes of foliations. And there were some various examples that have been constructed. Um, Thurston's first remarkable achievement was in studying foliations of the free sphere. It's not, it's not immediately obvious that the free sphere can be foliated. You would divide it up into surfaces that are all parallel. And if you know how to do it, you know how to do it, but if you don't, then it's, it's challenging. And he showed that there were so many foliations of the three sphere and his his um, his um, construction used hyperbolic geometry in, a, in an essential way. He showed there were so many foliations of the three sphere that the third homotopy group, which is a group constructed out of maps from three spheres of the Heffliger classifying space. So this is like a Grassmannian. I think of it as a nice infinite dimensional space, but it should have you know, built out of lots of cells. And this group, which is usually going to be a finite field, finitely generated abelian group, has a surjective homomorphism onto the additive group of real numbers. So it's really enormous. And so this result, which you proved as a graduate student, attracted a lot of, a lot of attention. Um, his thesis 
concerned foliations of three manifolds also. I won't say too much about it, um, except that it has, I think, the most useless um, bibliographic reference that I can think of. Um, he references in his thesis W. Thurston personal communication. <laughs> so it's not particularly useful unless you happen to be there when he's talking to himself. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I recommend this to <laughs> graduate students writing these <laughs> so don't get any ideas. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, shortly thereafter, he, as a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study, he showed the theorem through the following theorem. And I won't, I, I won't give the, the full generality just stated in, in, in dimension one. Suppose you, you have a, a closed n manifold. Now, <clears throat> if you have a co-dimension one foliation, if you foliate a manifold by hypersurfaces of submanifolds of dimension n minus one, then at every point you can take the normal line. We give the manifold metric and then talk about the normal line. And you pass to a covering space, and assume that, that normal line field is orientable and get a vector field. And so you get a vector field, so the Euler characteristic has to be zero. If it has a co-dimension one foliation. If it has a If it can be decomposed into n minus one dimensional submanifolds in a nice standard way. First, it showed that the converse was true, that this mild necessary condition was actually sufficient. Up to that time, many people were constructing examples of foliations of manifolds using things like open book decompositions and very beautiful ways of exploiting symmetry and it's very, but very special constructions that didn't look like we deal with the arbitrary n-dimensional manifold. But Thurston showed that um, any, any manifold with these relatively weak hypotheses did have this kind of structure. Let me say a little bit about the idea of a proof. He, with an assumption like this, there isn't a whole lot to work with. So he says, triangulate the manifold, divide it up into simplices like we were discussing before. And when you divide it up into simplices, you can, well, look at the foliation on the simplex. And so in, this, in the paper, he draws this amazing picture of a big simplex with a bunch of leaves, foliation, he actually puts a tree with branches, a trunk, to illustrate the leaves. And the important thing is to make sure that the leaves are all transverse to the faces of the, of the simplex. So he um, then has to adjust the foliation in the simplex so that it matches up on the boundary. So it, the Heffliger structures, the maps into the classifying space, they would correspond to foliations that would have certain singularities. So the first step is to make sure that, the, that, it's, a, that it's actually a real foliation near the, near the boundary, which is not hard to do. And then you get the singularities inside that you want to get rid of. And so he sort of projects out. So he called the first step civilization. So in this picture of this enormous Ooh. tree, with lots of leaves, he shows how it's civilized, and then you sort of push it out to the boundary, and that's what he called inflation, and the main line in this paper is that civilization leads, like, leads to inflation. <laughs> so this is the paper on foliations in co-dimension greater than one, which he then modified to do this theorem. And well, <coughs> I think at that time, from what I'm told from colleagues that were working in the subject at that time, people were intimidated by him and 
left when they started moving away from the field. Um, these paper, the papers that he wrote in this period, I, I don't think there have been too many papers following up. And it always struck me as being a little bit strange that he had these you know, amazing ideas that solved problems that nobody was even close to seem to have gotten lost. And he addresses that in the, in the, in the 1994 paper. Um, so that destroyed Jobs. Jobs were created in his um, later work on two manifolds, the three manifolds. Now I got involved in this in the subject. Um, he, was he, he was interested in a simple problem. <clears throat> um, I think the earthiness of this. Um, sense of humor are inherent through all of this. Um, I didn't prepare any, this talk's not very high tech, but if you look in the previous issue of the bulletin of the AMS, there's a, a photograph, I'll just pass this around, of a mural that if you, it's been at Evans Hall in Berkeley, made before, up until the seven years ago or so. On the seventh floor, there was a big mural that was painted of a really long, simple, close curve on this surface. And the, picture, and the discussion that he gave was that you imagine transforming the surface. So this is a disk with three holes removed. And you get a diffeomorphism by taking these two disks and moving them around, followed by doing this, these two disks. And so this first curve doesn't, this curve that I drew doesn't get affected by that, but then when you wrap it around like that, then you get something that looks kind of like, let's see if we get lost here, so maybe I'll even try. But you get a longer curve. You can see that on the last page of this, in this article. When you imagine iterating this procedure, and the fact that the curve doesn't intersect itself is preserved under this transformation under this homeomorphism. And if it doesn't intersect itself and it's getting longer and longer, then it's going to be following strands that are almost nearly parallel. And in the limit, what does it look like? Well, in the limit, it looks like a foliation. And having understood foliation so well and understanding some of the dynamic, the phenomenon occurring in um, an also um, dynamical systems, he was led to develop a space you know, in 1975, 76, this was the space of measured foliation, which was a kind of completion, completion of the set of simple closed curves on a surface. And now, when I say simple, I mean a curve that doesn't intersect itself. The point is that simple closed curves can be quite complicated because if they're, as an example like this shows, that they can wrap around many, many times but they need to be very tightly constrained if they don't cross themselves. And for example, the simple closed curves on the torus this is classically known. These can be de determined by their homology class. They correspond to um, relatively prime pairs of integers. And relatively prime pairs of integers, of course, correspond to rational numbers. And how do you complete, make a continuous object completing the rational numbers? Well, you take the real numbers. And so the general picture that Thurston gets is you take a simple closed curve corresponding to 
a rational number p over q in reduced form is obtained by taking a curve on the square, so the torus of the, the um, plane modulo the integer lattice, and then take a curve that has slope p over q. Then it'll be a curve that goes around in the x direction p times, or q times, and in the y direction p times. If p and q are relatively prime, then the first curve you take will be simple. And what's the completion? Well, let p and q be rational numbers. Approaching an irrational number, that will correspond to a foliation of the torus, the square that's identified by lines of, of that arbitrary irrational slope. And I won't go into the details, but Thurston showed that a similar picture existed for um, surfaces of higher genus and developed a space upon which the homeomorphism group of, of, the sur of the surface acted. And this gave a normal form for a surface homeomorphisms. So this group of diffeomorphisms of the surface, homeomorphisms of the surface, modulo isotopes, so through connected components in this space, is a very important mathematical object called the mapping class group. So the structure group of low-dimensional topology. And al algebraic properties of the mapping class group are very important in studying not just dimension two, but also dimension three and dimension four. And using this theory, he showed that um, gave a normal form for the um, elements of the mapping class group. Similar to Jordan canonical form. Okay, so his interest turned or began to concentrate in dimension three. And he wanted to know examples of, 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 of what three manifolds look like. And I think this, as I mentioned, I think this is maybe the most lasting intellectual contribution. The picture of three manifolds that he developed in the late 70s has turned out to be an accurate one. And many of the conjectures that were made in the late 70s have since been proved through the work of many mathematicians. Uh, in 1976, he just wanted to see what some interesting examples would be. So not complements for one. Another example you might get would be from reflection groups. And so I'll say a little bit about what happened in the fall of 1976. You might take a polygon or a polyhedron and then look at, say, a group generated by reflections in the faces. So for example, you could take an equilateral triangle and then start reflecting the equilateral triangle on its side and then you get a tiling of the plane by equilateral triangles. Familiar pattern for bathroom floors. And you can imagine doing the same thing in higher dimensions. And you can imagine doing the same thing in other geometries, such as spherical geometry. So for example, if you take a sphere, and you can chop it up into eight right triangles. Spherical geometry, you can have a triangle that has three right angles. And this corresponds to the eight octants R3. And then get a finite group, a reflection group, generated by the sides. And in hyperbolic space, you have even more freedom to build a poly polyhedron. So, in order to formulate conjectures, one really needs a good supply of examples to test them against. And this is a good way of doing that. And he wanted to talk about a more general object that wasn't going to be a manifold, but a manifold quotient by the, one of these groups. So you might imagine taking the plane and its quotient by the group generated by reflections, a fundamental domain is the triangle. But the boundary and the vertices of the triangle have special significance. So here you have, it looks like a half plane, and here it looks like a sector of 
60 degrees. And so these are sort of like manifolds that are folded up. And he wanted to develop a, he wanted to develop a theory. This is called a manifolded, a folded up manifold. So in the course, <laughs> for about a week, people were talking about manifold this to make sure that they were knew that they were talking about manifold deaths rather than manifolds, that they were folded up manifolds. And that became somewhat objectionable. So he then proposed that a new name, an, an improvement was a fold man. <laughs> I don't know if that was much of an improvement. And eventually, after the enough um, disgruntlement, it was decided to open it up, since this is a democracy. And we had a vote. And the um, winner of the name was Orbefold, which has now become quite standard. Yeah, so this, this is a manifold, which is locally in orbit space. And the geometrization picture that he had maybe started with understanding some of these examples. So let me close with the statement of what geometrization is and the picture of three manifolds. The, um, Dimension two, we have the Euler character as a single term. So we have Euler character plus two, which is the two sphere. And the two sphere has Euclidean geometry, uh, spherical Euclidean geometry. The next value of the Euler character is zero, and you have the torus. And the torus is represented by a square with its um, opposite sides identified. Okay. And that gives rise to a Euclidean geometry on the torus. And then, once the Euler characteristic is negative, you get much more variation. You get surfaces of higher genus. And they all have hyperbolic geometry, as was known to Poincaré and many mathematicians of the 19th century. And so the geometrization of two manifolds is into these three, three flavors. Well, three manifolds are more complicated. And another thread, which Thurston united, so, was the existing three-dimensional topology. It was known that every three manifold could be decomposed along two spheres. So you, as you can see, two spheres and tori are sort of special among surfaces. So you can imagine taking some three-dimensional manifold, like a knot complement, and then connecting it up by a two to another three manifold. And inside that two would be a two-dimensional sphere. And this was a notion of connected sum. You remove a disk from one, a disk from another, and then glue the components together. And Knazer and Milner showed that every three manifold can be uniquely decomposed as a connected sum. So it makes sense to look at ones that can't be decomposed. Much later, in fact, in the 1970s, um, it was shown that there was a, a similar decomposition along tori. And so this is the work of Jaco, Shale, and Johansson. The JSJ decomposition, which is a decomposition along tori. And the condition on the torus, so first of all, once you decompose along the torus, there are lots of ways of filling it in. For the two-sphere boundary, there's only one way, which is shunt please theorem. But for a torus, there are lots of ways of filling it in with a solid torus. So we want to look at three manifolds that are not necessarily closed, but the boundary is a union of tori, is an actual set. And then once you decompose along tori, they showed that this was unique in a certain sense. The geometrization conjecture of Thurston, now theorem by Perelman, is that the remaining pieces have geometry. 
So it's more complicated than in dimension two, where every surface has a geometric structure, one of these three types of geometry. Now you have to decompose it along in a very specific way into various pieces. And three dimensions is more complicated than two dimensions. Here there are only three geometries. In dimension three, there are eight geometries. And the Poincaré conjecture can be stated that every three manifold that should have a spherical structure, that it has fun, finite fundamental loop, is a quotient of the three sphere. So this is the setting of the Poincaré conjecture. There are also three manifolds that look like two manifolds, like S2 cross S1. This has a different geometry. Um, these are sort of the ones that have some positive the ones corresponding, including a manifold, quotients of R3 by lattices, and then quotients of those. There are only finitely many topological types of these. It was proved by Bieberbach in the early 20th century. There are some twisted versions for manifolds, quotients by Milton Lee groups, the, Heisen, the three dimensional Heisenberg group. Also, some rather interesting three manifolds that are obtained by taking a hyperbolic automorphism of the torus, so an integer matrix that has real distinct eigenvalues, look at the, the corresponding map of the torus to itself, and then take a suspension of that to an interesting geometry, solved geometry. These were basically well understood. Um, and then you have hyperbolic free space. I'll put that down here because the picture should really look like this. But most three manifolds should be hyperbolic. Then there were two geometries that have some hyperbolic two dimensional geometry, such as the geometry of products. And then you could have another geometry where it's not. Twisted product that are unit tangent on the hyperbolic plane, or the Lie group, which has been a good model for that, is the Lie group SL2R, left invariant metric. But these are the, the eight ways of putting geometry on a three map. Okay. So, this is the picture that he developed. I think it's fair to say that nobody really saw this pattern addresses this in the article. And proving this, he improved many special cases of the geometrization conjecture, involved bringing in techniques from all kinds of different mathematics, from dynamical systems, from three manifold topology, number theory came in at certain points, some type Miller theory and Kleinian groups, which the main technique was quasi-conformal mappings, which had become a very um, well-developed uh, analytic machine played a crucial role in, in his proof. But the general picture was that the, the three manifolds had this, this pattern in that system approved. Okay, so I'll stop there, but I should encourage you to look on the web to see how these eight geometries and the geometrization have applications to fashion design. <laughs> <laughs> I'll finish with a little story about myself. Every time I look at everything he wrote, I kept thinking, oh, I know that. Oh, I was thinking about that. Because Thurston influenced Bill, and Bill had somewhat of an influence on me. I kept thinking, Bill kept telling me about this. Why didn't I learn this before? But the weirdest uh, contribution, or where it affected my life, is I took my parents to the uh, Philadelphia Flower Show many, many years ago, when I was at the University of Pennsylvania. And as I walk in, they had this futuristic one. And there it was, playing on a big, huge screen. Well, back then, it was a bunch of little screens. Not, not. <laughs> there it was. The of you. And then I went to buy, and later on that week, that's, uh, that year, I went to buy a washer dryer. 
and they had somewhere, they had a big screen TV there too at the local appliance store, and no, lo and behold, Not Not was playing on that too. It was like, so it was just haunting me where I went. It was haunting me too. My younger son really liked the movie and watched it all the time. When, when, we wouldn't want to watch it all the time. He ate his dinner. <laughs> anyway, are there any, any quick questions? Otherwise, we'll have to talk to him afterwards because it's uh, a little late. All right. Maybe oh. a quick comment. Very big outreach program. And right. I don't know if you could, because I know that while he was director at uh, MSRI, uh, Howard and I think that was when we established the best link with MSRI. And, yeah, and he came here himself and gave talk. And not only that, he joined us to a party at uh, right. Leslie's house. Uh, yeah, I remember coming to that. Exactly. Uh, and definitely his talk is something memorable. As you said, he uses computer. You would think he's a pure mathematician, so he would not be working with computers, but he does. And, I mean, very nice pictures. So, so if you can add a little bit more about his outreach program, that not really that familiar with that. Yeah, I see. Well, I, I I know the person. I know that he'd done a lot at MSRI as well. Right, right. right. But also, I went to Westchester University, which is a pretty small little place one time, and I went there because. Thurston went there to give a talk, and he would go a lot of places where you wouldn't necessarily expect him to be. So, so anyway, let's thank you again.